You're listening to the Daily Mishnah Podcast with Benedict. We're in the centre of the chapter of Bame, Bame Madlikin. With what can we light? And I thought it'd be interesting just to bring a picture of the kind of lights that they used in those days. And you can see this earthenware jug with a hole at the top. One would fill it up with oil from the top. And then there's a little hole at the side where the wick would go in. So the wick would poke out of the side and the light then would come out of the side. And then on the other side, opposite from the hole where the wick is, there's a little bit of a handle. So you can pick it up and carry it around. And you would keep it fueled up by pouring oil in at the top. And the Mishnah, the fourth Mishnah, is going to ask, well, could we put some kind of feeding object in at the top? So what if we took an egg? You can can see that the hole at the top of this lamp is about the right size to balance an egg on top of it. So what if we took an egg, egg an an egg shell, an empty egg, and we put a, we drill or we make a little hole at the bottom of the eggshell. And then we balance it on top of the a lamp. You can see it'll balance really nicely on top there. And then we can fill up the eggshell with oil and the oil will drip into the lamp. And that way we can feed the lamp more reliably. So it's a lovely, it's a bit like an extra fuel tank in a car. And there doesn't see you any problem in doing this before Shabbat. And it's interesting that the Mishnah begins by saying, we don't do it. Lo yikov. We don't pierce an eggshell and fill it with oil and place it over the mouth of the lamp. Bishfil shir tehei so that it drips. Afilu shell cheres. Even if it's clay, even if it's actually made out of clay so it's really part of the lamp and then Rabbi Huda permits and of course we know already Rabbi, not, the halacha is not going to go to Rabbi go according to Rabbi Huda. and then the Mishnah closes it says if the potter makes it like that then there's no um, there's no way around it we can't avoid it if the, if the potter actually made the lamp with a special vessel above it so that you could feed it from above, then, you know, we have to accept it. And the Gemara explains that the problem with this seems to be not so much a problem of fueling the lamp on Shabbat, because we are going to fuel the lamp before Shabbat comes in. So we're not doing this on Shabbat. We're doing this before Shabbat. But the problem which the Gemara is going to spot, and or, or the problem which the Gemara is going to assume underlies the Mishnah, I think we can take the Gemara, I think we can take their view as read, by the way, on this one. They understand the debates around the Mishnah. They have access to a memory bank, which is greater than ours. The question the Gemara is asking, well, is not so much feeding the lamp on Shabbat, but taking the oil away. And we've said before that many of the halachot we're learning here are halachot which are established in order that people should not get into a situation where they might break Shabbat by accident. So we're not going to use a wick which is imperfect. We're not going to use oils which are imperfect. We're not going to put a roast into the oven in a situation where we might be tempted to stir up the coals. And in the same way, we're not going to set up a... Once we've set up that container of oil feeding the lamp, we can't take it away. Because, well, first of all, by taking it away, we're extinguishing the lamp. And second... Once we've set designated that oil for lamp feeding during Shabbat, it becomes muktzah. We'll learn more about the concept of muktzah as we go through the, the tractate, but essentially that oil is designated for burning. You can't take it away and, I don't know, sprinkle it on your salad. And that seems to be the anxiety of the Mishnah, that if we if we build on this second fuel tank to the lamp, we might be tempted to take that fuel away and use it elsewhere. And it's exactly the same if we fed the wick from, let's say, multiple places. Let's say we had a multi-threaded wick and we put each the end of each wick into a different dish of oil. 
Lo yimale adam et hakara shemen. We don't fill a dish of oil and place it at the side of the lamp and put the wick end into it. Although Rabbi Yudah is going to permit it. Because again, we're anxious that you, someone might just take that dish of oil away and use it for some other purpose. But we are going to extinguish the lamp if there's a real human need. And the Gemara, the, 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 the Gemara says here, I'm sorry I didn't bring this on the source sheet. The Gemara says it's better to extinguish a light which is made by man than to extinguish a light that's made by God. Referring, of course, to a human life. And so the Mishnah explains, If someone's afraid of non-Jews, or mipnei listim, or robbers, or mipnei ruach ra'a, ruach ra'a, the Rambam explains this very clearly. He, this is some, the Rambam explains this very clearly as some kind of mental illness. This, someone is ang- anxious of the light, but feels okay in the dark. It's it, it's clearly a psychiatric. It's interesting that the the Mishnah and the commentators clearly know about mel- mental illness and they're making halacha about it. Mm-hmm. And for a sick person, so he can sleep, patur, we're exempt. In fact, we, in fact, we are, we're obligated to do this if there's a danger to life. But we don't do it in order to save the materials. We can't extinguish the lamp because we want to spare the lamp or the oil or the wick. And Rabbi Yossi is going to exempt in all cases except for the wick. But again, the halacha doesn't go according to Rabbi Yossi. And then, as we draw this chapter to an end, and these conflicts of values, because that's really what we're talking about as we close the chapter, we have this famous and disturbing Mishnah. There are three transgressions for which women die in childbirth. Because they're not observant of Nida, Chala, and the kindling of the lights. And whenever we've learned this Mishnah, we've always asked, well, are women particularly susceptible to... To, to to danger on these three mitzvot. And I could not resist bringing you the parallel Gemara. It's on page 32 of Shabbat, which asks, what about men? What about men? Don't these issues apply to men too? And the Gemara asks, well, okay, so when are men in danger? Or when are they examined? And Reish Lakish says, when they're crossing a bridge. Just as childbirth is a natural point of danger for women. And, you know, in England, in the in Middle Ages, women used to write a will, actually, before going before uh, giving birth. Reish Lakey says, when crossing a bridge. And Rav says he wouldn't cross a river in a ferry in which a Gentile sat. And Shmuel actually would only cross in a ferry if there was a Gentile in it. And, but there's a, but so, the, you know, these are clearly points of danger, crossing a bridge, crossing in a ferry, going over water. But it's very interesting that Rabbi Yanai would examine the ferry. Yeah, Rabbi Yanai bedake the avar. He would check and cross. And Rabbi Yanai is a rationalist. He says, you know, we don't rely on miracles. In fact, he, he says this explicitly. A person should never stand in a place of danger saying that a miracle is going to be performed for him. Maybe, you know, maybe he won't get a miracle. Or maybe if he gets a miracle, they'll deduct it from his merits. He quotes, uh, 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 he quotes a verse from Bereshit related to, um, to Yaakov. Yaakov prayed to be delivered from, uh, Esav. And he, the Gemara then quotes Rabbi Zer, who wouldn't go out and walk among palm trees on a day when there's a strong wind blowing. So the Gemara seems to be saying, OK, maybe there's maybe, maybe there's divine protection. It doesn't deny there's divine protection. But the Gemara seems to be saying, you know, at these moments of danger. We need to take care. We, you know, before crossing a bridge, you should check the bridge. Before, you know, before going into before going into labour, you need to t- 
take whatever precautions you can to make sure that you're safe. That the this Gemara is, if you like, anti-superstitious. And it forces us really to think about what risks we take and how we guard against those risks because we do have to protect life whenever possible. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Daily Mishnah Podcast with Benedict.